So what we're going to do today is I'm going to tell you about me. I'm going to tell you about kind of what Riot Games does and get you an overview of that. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about the games that we build and stuff. And then I want to talk about the problems and the contexts that we solve. I think League of Legends and like these bigger AAA games have a lot of non-obvious ways we use machine learning. And I would like to kind of uh, peel back the curtain a little bit and just show some of the things we do. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit of some tech deep dives, but it's not going to be like something you would see in one of the more technical tracks. It's just going to be like a highlight of some of the products. I'm going to kind of break them down at a small level so you can kind of get like a grasp of what's going on. Um, and we're hiring. So like if you see this and you're like, dang, I want to do like machine learning for League of Legends, like hit me up. Hit up my manager, hit up anybody you see who's a recruiter at Riot, tell them that you saw my talk. Like, we're more than happy to take cool talent. Um, so I'm going to talk about me. So this is me. That's, that's a picture. We take pictures at Riot. It's like a big thing. I'm a software engineer or like a machine learning engineer. I don't really know what you'd call me, but I work on data stuff, and I work on machine learning stuff as a software engineer. I used to be an engineer at DoorDash. My old manager is also here. He's very smart. Buy him a, buy him a drink if you see him. Um, before that, I was a data engineer at Adobe. I'm a musician and a dad. That's my band, Circle of Size. We're like a black metal band. We're putting out a record in a week. Listen to Circle of Size. Check it out. I play drums. Um, so I, I am in a team called League Data Central. Um, it is an initiative. And kind of the way we've structured ourselves at League Studios is a series of initiatives who do like particular uh, kind of verticals within the game. So there's uh, the Game Engine team, which has a fancy name, but I'm not allowed to say it. Uh, and they are headed by like Jim Bowles and some other like really smart folks who work on like the game engine and like the tooling pipelines and like the assets and like really intense kind of like game devy stuff that you probably think about when you think about game development. Um, there's my team. I'm going to mention a couple folks who work with me. There's our service ops team, who's kind of like the SREs or like the back-end engineers in general. Um, and we kind of work, all three of us, ideally in tandem to support all the games that run on something called like the League Studios engine. And it's worth kind of talking about that. The League Studio engine is like, if anyone's familiar with like Unity, or Unreal, or like these tools that help uh, developers build video games, kind of our, have our own like homegrown one. But that's not the case throughout the whole company. Um, League Studio is just like a part of it, right? And then we have all the other game studios, and we have Infrastructure Platform. My wife also works there. She's way over there in the corner. Um, and the reason I point this out is because League Data Central doesn't really operate data in a vacuum. Just like we don't operate like a game engine in a vacuum, we are a part of a bigger group. There's kind of a mesh of data organizations that help build stuff. So uh, League Data Central kind of sits in this middle place, but we also have like a central data warehouse team who just think about Spark and how you do Spark. We have a team who works on our data catalog and Alation, and they, they kind of support all that cool stuff. And that's kind of what they're thinking about. Um, so that's kind of like a breakdown of what the people are. But like I, I gathered from like talking to people and like hanging out with folks that like I should maybe talk about the video games. So like if you know about League of Legends or Teamfight Tactics, like glaze over your eyes because I'm going to give a really brief description. But if you don't, uh, Riot builds a lot of games. We have League of Legends, which is kind of like this 10-year-old game at this point. It's very popular. We have Legends of Runeterra, which is a, uh, well, its acronym is the CGC, which is actually kind of tough to say, but it's a like card game. So for those of you who play like Magic the Gathering or Yu-Gi-Oh, it's kind of like that. It's actually my favorite game that we make. Um, We've ported League of Legends over to mobile. That's the Wild Rift version. We have a game called Teamfight Tactics. We have a game called Valorant. We partner with a separate studio called Riot Forge, which builds um, 
kind of a, 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 a smattering of games in different genres based on the League IP and the, like, the Runeterra IP. Um, so things here are like The Ruined King. That was a game that came out recently on the Switch. Um, there's a game that was just announced about Silas that's going to come out that's kind of Hades-like, which I'm pretty stoked about. Um, I can't play the game in front of you guys, which was like kind of a cool thought, but like just to like briefly give pictures, this is what League of Legends looks like. It's a MOBA. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, but it's like a 5v5 game where you kind of like build a composition with your team, and the whole point is to like overtake the map, and you know, like there's lots of different interactions, there's neutral like camps that you guys can compete over. Um, and it's been going on for a few years. Kind of a similar game in the space is uh, Dota. Dota 2 is like similar. Um, you shouldn't be surprised that Wild Rift looks exactly the same, but it's on mobile, so we have that. Um, Team Fight Tactics is really cool, and I wanted to like spend a second here because something I talk about later is very involved with Team Fight Tactics, so I want to like make sure you folks understand clearly. But Team Fight Tactics is almost like an auto battling chess kind of game, so you kind of have a, a, a deck of players um, or like a bench of champions that you kind of build into compositions and then they like auto battle to win. Um, so then like, you know, the whole point is to like build better compositions as kind of the thing, as kind of the game rolls on by balancing like the amount of kind of gold you have and like the composition and the stacks and all this cool stuff. Um, definitely check out Teamfight Tactics if you're looking for some, something to do tonight. I recommend for those of you who want to play and don't know what you're doing to play Hyper Roll specifically. It's fast, it's easier, and it's really enjoyable. Um, and like we've just got a ton more games. So like Valorant's over there if you play tax shooters. This is The Ruined King, which is an RPG. So if you're into like Final Fantasy or stuff like that. And we have games that are like in development right now, like our MMO, um, which are like kind of R&D stuff, but can only talk to you about so much, right? Before I, like, I start giving away company secret sauce. Um, so that's the games. Uh, we have people who play our games. I'm sure you know that. We have a very kind of big fan base. We've been doing this for a long time. And I guess kind of the point I wanted to call out here is like, we have people who are very dedicated in the, the cosplaying community and the lore community. We have like a bunch of YouTubers who like to watch and just think about how our game is. We have people who play this professionally so they're like playing the game as as a sport and we like pay them and they're like 19 and they're like incredibly talented at the game and I'm like 31 and having a crisis over like sequel so like <laughs> it's super tight uh, check them out do the things um, so synopsis for all of you who walked into the room and caught up um, we make games uh, my team specifically thinks about games built on the League engine, which is like Unity, but proprietary. We're talking about kind of three games today, LoL, TFT, and Wild Rift. There are more, but I'm really going to mostly talk about those. Um, and we kind of have like a couple different places we think about machine learning and data products. We think about them in the video game. We think about them around the video game, like when you're getting into the queue or when you log in or whatever. And of course, we have like back of house, data analytics kind of stuff. Um, and I think to best understand when we build what, it's good to think about the different kind of people that we work with. So these are the logos of the different regions of Runeterra. So like, if you don't know about Runeterra, welcome to the club, probably a lot of you don't. Uh, that's okay, you don't need to know what these symbols are. Uh, it's just like the different areas. Uh, fun fact. The only typo in this slide, the only typo in this deck is the next slide. See if you can find it. Um, so I want to talk about, I guess, kind of the, the, the division of, of people, and I want to walk through what they think about, what their context is, and what their problem space is. Um, so obviously, there's us, there's data people, right? We do, we do the things. Um, we have a trade of folks who are kind of colloquially called game designers. So they're really thinking about like, how do people play this game? Who is it for? Like, how do we like tie it into the lore? What changes are we making that are affecting the lore? Like, are we making the game broken? Are people still gonna have fun? And they're really kind of thinking about it from like 
the, the, the person who really just like loves video games perspective. There's operations who deeply care about making sure nothing's broken. Um, and this may seem weird to call out, but uh, just for some context, League of Legends has uh, shipped every two weeks for like the last six years. So every two weeks, a new patch has gone out. A lot of that is thanks to the operations folks. There's one exception, which was 13.2. Uh, you can hit me up in off. You can hit me up in office hours to hear about 13.2. But it was a fun whole thing. I was talking to. I think I was talking to you about it after at dinner. Um, and then there are engineers. Now, when you see engineers, you probably think of me, or maybe Max up here, or other engineers. But I want to caution and and say that there are different kinds of engineers in the world. And these engineers that we're talking about are typically uh, very good <laughs> at building video games. That is like a big skill about their stuff. And they might not really know about data. And in some cases, they know even less about data. And we'll get into that. But first, let's start easy. And let's talk about kind of designers. So like the, 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 the key here is like when we interact with designers, what we're really doing is like we have a ton of data scientists on League Data Central and they will embed directly with game design teams. That's like where they're most impactful. So like when there's a game designer thinking about, hey, I want to introduce like a new dragon into the neutrals camp, a data scientist can kind of be there to be like, well, are you sure you want to do that? 70% of all players don't go after the dragon or like we've got this kind of response, we've got this kind of sentiment around these kinds of dragons. So they can really kind of be there and help do these kind of decision making things early. I guess kind of throwing back to the last talk that we just had. Um, there's a big aspect of interpretability that is kind of important at League. And like the idea here is the game's just not fun if like some model plays the game for you. It's just, it's just not fun. It's not cool if like you go into the item shop and it's like, oh hey, this is your opposing team. They're all weak to this. Buy Trinity Force and just like destroy everybody. It's not fun. You want it to be like a fair thing. So there's a lot of work that kind of goes into like a trade-off between like, oh, well, we can build this like super sick GAN that can like, you know, play the game and do all this cool stuff. And the designer asking like, well, why would I do that? Does it make the game fun or does it make it worse? And like just kind of this, this drive that like we're not a support function, which I hope for those of you who work in data kind of know like and embody that pain. I feel like often, especially at bigger corporations, you kind of just feel like the dashboard dudes. Like you went to school for all this cool stuff and then like you build Tableau dashboards and it's like, okay, that's not what we do. We can do more. So there's a lot of work here. Um, now for operations, it's a little weird. They don't want you to break the game. Like, don't break the game. And that doesn't mean, like, don't check in busted code. We can take care of busted code. But, like, don't make me have to go onto Reddit and tell people that the game's not going to come out or that Trundle is still broken or that this art still looks jank. Don't do that. But also, don't break the game. Like, don't stick some model that is supposed to be important to matchmaking or MMR and then have it go down because that's like core to the player experience. So we need to be very like precise in our communication with operation folks to tell them like, yeah, we're, we're upgrading Bento ML. So now all of our models could run a bit slower and we're not really sure what that means. So we have to kind of do a lot of this work to provide like accurate controls over this stuff so they can turn stuff off. Like it's horrible getting paged at two in the morning because like, you know, some model is just like totally jank because coefficients got lost or whatever. And all you really need to do is just restart the service. Like we have a network operations center who look at graphs, who do this monitoring. They should be able to restart the service. Let's give them the tools to do that so I can go to bed. Um, and then there's engineers. Uh, this is a nice slide. And the, 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 the why it's a nice slide is because what we want to do is as like machine learning practitioners or data practitioners is when we work with engineers of various skills, um, we want them to make sure they deeply understand the overlap between what we're doing and the tools that they build. And we want to make sure that whatever we build like looks like something 
they would want, even if that means it's not like hot or sexy data science work. So we might not use Python everywhere because engineers think Python is really slow. So okay, great, we'll fork this and write it in C++. Fine, but let us run Python over here. Um, kind of the trade-off here is then we're working like really deeply with different engineering teams to like influence roadmap to help us like not suck one year later on. And there's a lot of work that we do to explain concepts in machine learning and data. And it, it's, it's funny, I, I had this conversation once with uh, like one of our architects who work on the game engine and having to like explain likelihoods and probability functions and like, yes, I need a floating point and yes, neural networks need like a lot of floating point numbers is maybe sometimes a bit difficult, but like to give them context, it's because like machine learning has always been in League of Legends and they've had to do shit like this. This is a decision tree serialized into C++. No labels, no nothing. This is garbage, right? <laughs> they were just given this giant C++ function of a bunch of if-else statements and all they could really do is just write this comment and call us some insights guy, which like, yeah, that sucks. So what we're trying to do is not do this anymore. This, this would be a good thing. I see like two people taking pictures of this, so go ahead. <laughs> I challenge you to find out what value 127 was and what value 32 was in this decision tree. Uh, I sure don't know what it was. All right, um, so let's talk about decision science. So this is kind of what I've coined a collection of products that we build that are around the realm of like back of health stuff or kind of understanding the meta. Nothing that would really change the game or an around game experience, but help give people information to make a good decision. Hence the name. Um, so I'm actually gonna jump forward one slide and then jump back. Just to give you guys the scale of why this kind of stuff is important, this is just like a graph of games that we've processed in the past couple of days. Um, we have multiple shards, which is to say multiple deployments of League of Legends. Some of them process a million games a day. Some of them process 500,000 games a day. And we've got a lot of these. So there's a lot of games, a lot of different kinds of people playing, and it's like not feasible to put all of that into like one Tableau dashboard or like a superset dashboard. Maybe superset. I don't know if superset scales like that. Does it? I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Great. Fantastic, good pitch. Um, so <laughs> let, me talk, let me talk about how we um, get data just for a second. Um, there's some kind of cool, insightful stuff we do here. But um, so the first thing, I'm gonna start kind of from the top and go down. I know this is like a lot of text, but I'll try to just talk a little bit. But um, we're a game. So we need to get a lot of data from the game. So we, I haven't seen this in too many places that I've worked uh, in like the data space. Like when, when I was working at DoorDash or when I have folks who worked at Bird or whatever or Lyft or any of those kind of places, like getting the holistic journey of like uh, a, a delivery or a ride or a rental of a scooter typically is like joining a bunch of data sets and like munging them together and like aggregating them and understanding what's going on. Um, League of Legends and TFT happens to be uh, server authoritative, which is like a game design mechanism, which means the game server rules all. So every request comes into the game server, the game server says, yes, check, you can do that, and then we can get, kind of get out of there. This is a really interesting data source. It is basically fully referentially integral, because everything that had to happen before the game had to come into the game server. Everything that happens in the game server can be recorded, and we basically are like, running right on top of the component that does the main thing of the business, the games. So this is like a really interesting data source. We've kind of like standardized into like dumping out all of this in like a shadow state kind of listener. It's actually the first thing I worked on when I joined this team. So we listen for all these different game events, bulk it up in memory, toss it out into a file, and then zip that up and jupe it on into the, onto the data warehouse. Um, this is, Good for a lot of good reasons. It sucks for some other reasons. Like the state changes every two weeks. So like you're always changing telemetry code. It's like never ending because everyone's always adding a new event. 
Um, and like, it is risky business holding anything in a link list or in a STD vector in a game server for telemetry, especially when like you could blow up the game server. So like we've had some embarrassing crashes because like the telemetry buffer got too big or whatever. So um, we also do some stuff that probably everyone does. We scrape service databases to kind of get dimensional data. This is well studied. You guys have probably thought about this all the time. Um, Kind of shitty. They're just things that we have to think about, like services don't know about the games. The telemetry is often the last thing people think about, so you have to do a lot of munging to get the stuff you want. We do have an event stream for microservices to kind of send fact data out. Um, this is great. Service teams can fire and forget. This is bad because service teams can fire and forget. So, like, it's double edged sword. The destination gets super bloated, but it's like a shared infrastructure, and we only have to maintain one library. So. Good and bad things. Um, we also do this work around designing the, or like ingesting the design pipeline. So like, we have a lot of tools. I don't know if people are familiar with like Maya or other kind of like 3D modeling tools, but we have our kind of own suite of tooling that we build um, that sits on top of Perforce. So we actually have a lot of tooling that like goes into Perforce, pulls out versions of these JSON files, reinterprets the state and like puts that into the data warehouse. It's really nice. All the metadata you could ever care about is in there. Like, is this skin yellow? Yes, the metadata will be in there. But this sucks to ingest. This is just like a giant pain point um, that we will probably never get away from. So great. So let me talk to you guys about Metapangu. So I'm going to jump over a slide. So this is Metapangu. This is a, uh, one of the data products we build that kind of leverages all this data. Um, and if you kind of recall the TFT picture I showed you earlier, there's often a question from game designers of like, what is a good composition and what are my players playing? I don't want to go watch Twitch streams for like six hours to figure that out. I don't want to go play games myself for like 13 hours and figure that out. I just want to like know what is a good composition, what is winning, what is losing, what are the trends about it. And this is Metapengu. So this is a... Um, it's like an LDA uh, model that just kind of joins and aggregates a bunch of things and it tosses it through like a regression model to get some of these kind of like coefficients to understand like what are like winning traits, what are most likely traits to win, what are most likely things to change, um, how are people like building their compositions. And this is really nice uh, because like there's just no more guesswork that folks have had to do. So like in, old ver in older versions of TFT, a composition change would be made, and often it was the wrong composition choice. So, like a week later, a micro patch would go out, and it would like rebuff certain champs or like nerf some champs. And this was just kind of like a designer's life for like the first couple of weeks of a patch. They were just constantly kind of tweaking it because they didn't really know what was going on. Uh, Metapengu is fairly real time, um, like every day, every couple of hours, which is good enough given kind of the the scale. So. Like game designers are actually able to get like a really nice understanding of like, okay, in this particular comp, I think Sejuani is like super strong. So like maybe let's nerf Sejuani a little bit so Sejuani doesn't just keep like absolutely winning. Um, this is like this is something that Emily Hansen has been working on on our team, and I guess his biggest claim to fame was in set nine and a half, I think it was, uh, when the set hit our internal like player environment. One particular composition had just happened its way into like a 100% win rate. So like, if you played with, uh, I think it was like, God, I think it was Yumi and, God, I don't even know. I think it might have been like Yumi and Jarvin or something. And if you happened your way into this composition, like, it just didn't matter. You just won. Like, the composition was just perfect. You had perfect self-healing. And like, people were just like, dominating on PPE. Um, luckily, this did not go to Reddit because it didn't go live because Metapangu looked really awkward for a game designer one day and they were like, oh shit, I need to nerf Yumi. Nerfed Yumi, all done. Uh, by the way, if you play Yumi, you're a terrible person. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so now I'm gonna talk about some in-game models. Um, so like, I guess before I get into it, like. For the data engineering components, like Stephen Pascal and Jacob Werderitz, they've been working really hard on like 
giving us a nice clean data warehouse. So like, this is gonna sound like we just went from like these end of game telemetry files to big models, but like, that is not the case. So like, I'm just not talking very much about the data warehouse here. Um, so when you think about in-game models, you're probably a little confused and you're probably asking yourself, well, what do you mean, Ian? So what I mean is a machine learning model that is either baked into the C++ binary, doing some evaluations, or the game server depends on a service that runs some evaluations to make a decision. And these may be non-obvious, but um, what I'd like to do is kind of break some of these down for you. So there are a couple different ways to like slice these models up. And I like to think of it as like, when do you need to like, uh, uh, when would an inference result change significantly? So we have this idea of like patch by patch systems. These are gonna be like recommendation systems that I'll talk about with you guys or like our position detection system. Uh, that'll change maybe every couple patches or something. There are game by game things and this is around like, are you inting, which don't worry, I'll describe what that means. Like, are you inting, are you playing bad, are you just being a shithead, those kind of things. Um, there are second by second models, which are things we're still kind of building about, and there are frame by frame models, which we're still kind of thinking about. I would love to come back to Data Council in like two years and talk more about these things in particular in like a more technical track. Uh, so I don't know, if you dig C++, come to Data Council 2025, and hopefully I'll be talking about it. Um, so let's talk about patch by patch. So uh, this thing up here in the top uh, right? Top right? Top right? Uh, top right? Yes. Yeah, great. Top right is the uh, item recommender. The thing right below it is a jungle path recommender. Both of these were built by Kellen Wolf. Um, so what these are, are your like very standard, well not standard, but like uh, very uh, consumable collaborative filtering uh, models. So these are models that just like understand like oh, what item composition on your player tends to win the most? What item composition is the most popular? Um, so you can kind of think of it as like an RBAX over the probability of the item. Um, hopefully that's nothing too kind of crazy. Uh, all I'm just highlighting here is we have like seven of these in game. So we have a bunch of different recommenders. They all run through like this like airflow patch into the C++ binary that gets built like at compile time and read. Um, what that looks like is we've had to like generously extend our build system to like reach out to S3 and other analytic data warehouses to eat all this data, turn it into like C++ assets and build it into the game. Um, so that means all of our testing happens in like Databricks pipelines and this kind of led to our design of like, okay, what we'll do is every patch, we will just go through all possible permutations generate a giant batch of predictions and then embed it into the game so when the players patch, they just patch down this game, this, this like recommendation data. This is really similar to doing like batch inference. Like if you just like compute a model over a bunch of results stored in a database or a cache and you look it up. This is very similar, except for we're talking about like, I don't know, a buffer of memory in like the game server. Um, so this is kind of the most novel approach we have um, these recommenders and kind of any of these in-game systems all kind of like standardized into this workflow um, of like Spark to do all the aggregations and all of our Spark models in there. Uh, we translate it into S3 and we push it into P4. And by the way, if you've never worked on Perforce, like if, if you see this like middle thing and you see like build, uh, Perforce sucks. It is really tough to write automation around Perforce for data tooling, especially big data tooling. Luckily, it's not like Git, where it's like a large file kind of like blows Git up, but Perforce is not fun. It's very tricky. There are a lot of semantics that you just don't think about. Um, then we have this custom library that my team maintains to do kind of the ETL or the data activation into the game. And then there's like a crap ton of game engine code that will like load all of this data. I can't really talk about any of the game engine code that's all proprietary, but it's all C++ anyway. So like, you guys probably don't care. Um, so then we have kind of a collection of models that uh, sit at this kind of game by game 
kind of inference. So like a game ends, we reach out to a service and we make some decision. Um, Riot, if you haven't gathered, uh, has built a lot of things uh, from scratch. And part of that is just because like the AAA gaming industry was maybe in a weird position when they started, so tools didn't quite fit. Uh, we've also been around for a long time. So like our compute and uh, kind of container orchestration system called R cluster is actually like three separate wrappers around like one uh, Mesos, two Kubernetes, and three something called Admiral, which we also built by hand, which is like our own container system. Um, and if you're really interested in that, there's like a seven piece blog blog post on like the tech blog. And it's all very long. So feel free to go like Google our cluster, Riot Games. You can find out all about this. Um, but for our purposes, why I bring this up is because this leads us to um, kind of the constraint that all of our ML services have, which is we run Java in the front end, and we have service configuration that is controlled by the NOC all over the place. So there's this very rich ecosystem of tools that we need to integrate with. There's this very rich ecosystem of machine learning tools that we want to use, and we need to smash them together in order to do anything good. So that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, so there's a couple of concepts I just want to break down, because um, like I, I pretty much already explained the tech, but like what are we doing when we're doing kind of a game by game inference? The best example is feeding detection. So feeding in League of Legends is you're intentionally playing bad. Um, you're just like giving the other team as much of an advantage as they can possibly have by making your team worse. And this is difficult because like players could just be having a bad day or they could be new. And like it's very easy to see a new player as a sucky player, but those are very two different things. So like there was no way to sort of heuristically solve this. And although they tried, um, my team and a lot of uh, a few other data scientists on the team worked really hard on like building a kind of feed and detection model that could one generate probability distributions of failure and two then assess if your kill was like a likely kill that was feeding. So I go into a lot of this in a blog post I did with um, the Seattle Data Guy. So if you like Google the Seattle Data Guy, League of Legends, I talk about this a bit more, but just to kind of highlight some of the things I talk about in that article. Um, these kinds of models can get kind of arbitrarily complex. In this case, it's kind of like a two-stage model, which I've seen a little bit before. So there's like a sort of generative model up front, not to be confused with generative AI, um, that does some kind of like uh, reinterpretation of the data into a probability distribution. And then there's a classifier that can just run and kind of sample from this distribution and understand, OK, did this kill actually look like a death? Or like was this an, a feeding kill? So then when a game ends, we can eat the data, we can go through all the kills, and we can kind of assess, was this a likely feeding death or not? And then we can kind of send that information out to other services and do player bans. Um, so there's only one me, and there's a lot of data scientists. So I don't care about what they model. This is some stand code. I don't know Stan, but I do care about like how they do their feature engineering and how they model. So one of the tools we build is called Oracle Lens. For those of you who attended the deep check, the deep checks talk on on Tuesday, this is actually very similar. Like a lot of what we were doing in Oracle Lens was very similar to deep checks, but with uh, some wrapping around like Python data classes to give kind of a nice interface to our data warehouse, to S3, and to our like kind of custom feature store. Um, so this was kind of giving data scientists a bit more guardrails to be able to like write a model with good feature engineering and not like, I don't know, accidentally miss a one-hot encoding or something. Um, so that means that they can do what like almost whatever they want at inference time. Um, so like this is this particular inference code. It's just SciPy. If you don't remember your binomial probability distribution, I don't blame you. It's there on the slide. Go read your stats book if you want to learn more about the binomial probability distribution. Um, but I guess like the, the interesting part about all of this is 
So they've got this model in, in Python, great. They read from this feature store using your library, great. But like, how does it actually get somewhere is a really kind of important uh, discussion. So if you break it down by like the machine learning lifecycle and then you like step back, there are really just two components we think about. We think about how does it get trained and how does it get deployed. Um, so for training, we're like big Databricks users. We use a crap ton of Databricks. So almost everything happens in Databricks. If it has to be a little more advanced, we do provide like EC2 machines for our data scientists um, with like connections into the Spark world if, if they need it. Uh, so they can like build their packages, they can upload it into like an internal artifactory, and then we leverage Bento ML. For those of you who don't know Bento ML, it's like this really slick uh, model serving layer built on built on top of a uh, clipper that came out of Berkeley. Um, and the reason we do this is because we're kind of like hamstrung to this Java layer that we need to integrate with. So all of our rich tooling around like request handling and like session management and like credential and token validation has to happen up in a Java layer. And the Python layer just has to do like a model evaluation. So Bento is kind of the nicest to containerize. So we went with Bento. Uh, it has a lot of nifty advantages. It has a lot of constraints. Like models have to be served out of like a PyPy registry. So you always have to download and install a PyPy registry. So what I'm getting at here is because of kind of the uh, ecosystem of tools that existed at Riot and the necessity to use like open source technologies in Python, our design got really limited really fast. So we've ended up with this kind of bento ML kind of system. Um, kind of what we're exploring uh, now is we have another model in production um, that is a bit more sensitive to latency, shall we say. So if it's kind of a loose latency model, there is a world where it's like, all right, data scientists, I've built you some frameworks, I've built you some tools, go build whatever model you want, just use the tooling that I provide you but I will not keep tabs on your SLA. And this is nice because like some ML models only get like 80 requests a week or something. And like that's a bit more feasible for someone to manage. But if it's a really tight SLA, if like the game server depends on a response or like if the decision is like, do we pay this person right now for their competitive integrity or not? Um, there's only one me. So they get to use the framework that I know. <laughs> so when it goes into the to the more tight world, there's a lot of like collaboration with like us machine learning engineers to like pick the right framework to do the right thing, which is a much even a more limited set. So uh, again, for the plug, if you're hiring and you're specialized in like an ML framework, <coughs> hit me up. I could use more people. Um, so I'm pretty much done. Just some future work that we're talking about to kind of hype folks up. Um, we're working a lot with uh, PyMC and like generative modeling to try to do like, you can think of it as like generative load testing on top of data. Um, we're working more with like finding better ways to run machine learning models besides like pre-aggregating data and loading it in the game binary. We'd love to ship models without having to do a decision tree serialized in C++ and without having to write linear regression.cpp but we'll see where we end up. Um, and we're constantly looking to like expand our tooling and our experimentation space especially. Um, and this is all because um, you know, we as kind of a, a, a data products team, we're just trying to like own our destiny within League of Legends. And we're trying to make sure that like machine learning looks a lot less big and a lot less scary to our game teams so we can deliver more things to our players. Uh, so that's been me. That's Thresh up in the corner. That's my wife's favorite uh, like lead character. Thank you all so much.